I'm going to ask you to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. We continue looking at the, how we live our life out and in relation to uh, all the blessings that we have, all the gifts that we have from the Lord, especially in this context of our series, Gifts and Agape in the Church. Lesson 15 of this series, topical number 826, 1 Corinthians 13, 1 through 3 is our main verses tonight. At least I plan it that way. And I entitled this, Living Sacrifices Are Giving Sacrifices. You know, Paul says in Romans 12 that we are uh, living sacrifices. We're not dead sacrifices. We're living sacrifices. Raised up in Him. They had issues in Corinth dealing with the pettiness that went on between different groups because of the uh, special uh, special uh, uh, miracle type gifts. People were uh, focused on what they thought they were doing when it was really God doing it th- through them. But they were somewhat taking the credit for it. And as we know, uh, Corinth though gifted in many things from the spiritual realm, uh, they many of them, as Paul said in 1 Corinthians 3, they were very carnal people. Many of them were. I mean, all of them were, but many of them were. And he had a hard time uh, teaching them or getting them to any depth in their Christian growth. He wasn't the only one. There were others who tried as well. But um, so in this letter, he's explaining some things teaching things and part of it as we've talked about for several lessons is the gifts that were given for communication and uh, we talked about that uh, here in the last few lessons and uh, he says that uh, in verse 28 God set some in the church first apostles then prophets third teachers and after that miracles then gifts of healing helps governments diversities of tongues we covered pretty much that before but we looked at a few of those last time and then he did he said they're not all apostles they're not all prophets they're not all teachers uh they're not all workers of miracles have all the gifts of healing they don't people all don't did not everyone have that the apostles did but not everybody else in the church did and not all of them spoke with tongues though the apostles did uh Not all interpret, of course, had that gift, but he said, covet earnestly the best gifts, yet show I unto you a more excellent way. And that's where we get into our lesson tonight, so let's pray. Father, we ask as we get into the Word tonight, we'll see that there is the more excellent way uh, that is in our Savior, and that is in how uh, you have shown your love to us, shown your love to the world by sacrificing for us. Help us to, Heavenly Father, uh, not be so full of ourselves that we're not willing to be sacrificial within our own hearts uh, with people uh, in the ways that you give us opportunities to do that. We pray, Heavenly Father, that we'll understand that it's much more uh, than giving financially. It's also giving of our heart and our mind and and, and the spiritual gifts that you give us uh, of the time that we have in this life that we use it effectively for the Lord, that we don't let it get away from us. And then we take those opportunities to share the gospel and to share truth with other believers to help each of us to pick each other up and and to contribute to each other's edification and growth. So, Father, we ask that you'd help us to understand these things going forward as we get some learning from your word uh, this evening. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. I noted when I put the post on Facebook uh, this afternoon, about 30 minutes ago, that of all the talents, personalities, spiritual gifts, education and skills each believer brings into the church, we all have different skill sets, we all have different backgrounds, different training and different things, different personalities, some are more compatible, some are just different. That's just the way it is. Some different levels of education, some different talents. 
we all bring these uh, into the local church, but something greater than these exists. Something greater than any spiritual gift you and I have exists. And he calls it in verse 31, the more excellent way, and that's where chapter 13 rolls in. The more excellent way of which Paul speaks is found in chapter 13. It is the way of grace in the believer's life, which is built on personal virtue. As one author notes on this situation, he quotes less emphasis on the gifts and more emphasis on grace. More emphasis on grace. They didn't show much grace in Corinth. <laughs> uh, they missed out on that lesson, I suppose. Well, grace is a lesson that we learn that we need to show to others as God has shown it to us. And agape love is one of the greatest demonstrations of the grace of God. So one of the greatest ways that we show that we are of God is that we have this grace that God has shown to us of unconditional love. The Corinthians, as well as all churches, all of us, even today, need more virtue love or agape love. It is the more excellent way, as we will see in this chapter 13 of 1 Corinthians. It's easy to like one as long as they please you. So we're going to be bringing some principles out, and we'll get to these verses. But it's easy to like someone as long as they please you. But it takes real love when they don't. It takes real love to deal with the situation and to deal with our own attitude when folks uh, don't please us. And so it comes then more about our reaction to them or response to God. A reaction is something that we do that sometimes is seen in a negative connotation, but a response in kind from God's Spirit is demonstrated a little differently. Again, it's easy to like someone as long as they please you, but it takes real love when they don't. It takes real love to deal with our own attitude toward the folks when they don't please us. In other words, there's times when you just want to step on the gas and run over them, but you need to put your other foot on the brake, so you're burning rubber. <laughs> Smoke's coming out of your ears, but you're not saying anything. <laughs> okay. Unconditional love on our part shows we trust God knows the situation, and that's a confirmation or an affirmation to our own spirit that God is taking over the situation. When someone doesn't please you. And obviously, there's lots of things that people can do that won't please us. The you know, old saying is, and it's got some merit to it, consider the source. But at the same time, do we, we have to consider our reaction to that situation. Are we going to get all bent out of shape to the degree where we're like, you know, losing it? Unconditional love on our part shows we trust that God knows the situation the best and then it is our opportunity to demonstrate to God and to the other person that God is in this situation. That we kind of pull ourselves out of the situation and we let God come over and express His self in the situation rather than us expressing our dislike in the situation. That's not easy to do. And that takes years of growing. And there's been times when I was a young Christian where I would not have understood what this meant. I think I understand now, and some of it's by trial and error, of course. But in this section of our study of gifts and agape in the church, so far we've seen in chapter 12, verses 1 through 11, the origin of the gifts, and then the solidarity of the gifts of chapter 12, verses 12 through 31. And now in chapter 13, we'll look at the virtues of the gift at verses 1 through 8. And then we'll look again at some of the temporary gifts in verses 8 going on to verse 13. And then we get to chapter 14, we're going to look at the practicality of communication gifts. And then we're going to look at the order of decency in the church as a result of the expression of these virtues. 
So let's look at chapter 13 and verse 1. Though I speak with the tongues of men and angels, and have not charity, an old English word for love, or unconditional love, or agape, that's the word there in the original, and have not agape, unconditional love, I am become as sounding brass or a tinkling symbol. All right, Paul begins with the problem gift, the sounding brass and the tinkling symbol. That is the tongues of men. They love the sound of those strange languages coming out of their untrained mouths. They loved it. I saw a worship service on television the other night that I, I'm having a hard time flushing out of my memory. And the people were praying for the Holy Spirit to come and the leader of the church there in Ohio was instructing the people how to come up, how to raise their hands, how to wave their arms. The drums were going, the guitars were going, the music was getting louder. He was getting louder after he had given his soliloquy, or his sermon, excuse me. And he was trying to get the people who said that they had received Jesus to come forward and receive the filling of the Holy Ghost. That they truly did not have affirmation of their salvation until they could get the filling of the Holy Ghost. And the only re the way that they just demonstrated that they had had the filling of the Holy Ghost was that they were speaking in an unknown, glottal, or unknown tongue, unknown languages. That has nothing to do with the Bible teaching on, on tongues. And it was bad because he was asking them, and they were praising the Holy Spirit. All the songs that led up to it were songs praising the Holy Spirit. And I can tell you, there, there's not one verse of Scripture where the Holy Spirit seeks praise or worship. Not one verse of scripture in the Bible. And it is apostate to the end. And these people are raking in the money, not only in this nation, but also in other nations, especially some ignorant nations. And they're raking in the money hand over fist. They're having these fake healing services. And I didn't know that this was going to cause this. The preaching went along pretty good for a while. The man was very uh, articulate, very well dressed, of course, had the best of teeth and hair as you could know. You imagine that, of course. And I don't know if it was his hair or teeth, and I'm not sure. It didn't really matter. But there was words coming out of his mouth that sounded eloquent, and, and but then he just like a switch flipped. And when that switch flipped, he went back to that old Pentecostal mindset that you really don't know if you're saved unless you're speaking in tongues. You hadn't got the second blessing. And I thought that stuff died 50 years ago. It is not dead. It's alive. And the ignorance of Christians keeps their pockets full. It fills their coffers. And unsaved people fall for this as well. Because they sense that there's something weird about them. They must be holy. Because they have long through their lives believed that the weirder they are, the holier they must be. Because it's out of their element. And it's not biblical at all. But these Corinthians love the sound of those strange languages coming out of their untrained mouths. Of course, these were real languages, as we saw in the book of Acts. Not something that, as they say, you can pray and talk it out so that the devil won't know what you're saying. My wife and I, we talked about this coming back from the store this afternoon. I want the devil to know what I'm saying. I want him to know I'm coming after him in the name of Jesus Christ. I want him to know that I'm not afraid of him because I've already been put into the victor's camp. I'm not afraid of the devil. The Bible says if you will seek after God, the devil will flee after you. I'm seeking after God. Yeah, I know the devil's after me just like he is after you. Powers and principalities want to destroy us. We understand the battle. It's not strange to us. <laughs> the tongues of angels such as those who spoke to the shepherds in Luke 1, 13 through 20 and Luke 1, 26 through 38, well, they must have been angelic because they knew exactly what those angels were saying to them. Fear not, for I bring you great tidings Glad tidings of great joy. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Great messages were given. And they were understood coming out of the heavens. Why does ours have to be backwards 
for it to get up to heaven. Nothing in the Bible says for you to get a message to heaven that it's got to be spoken in a non-loan language. Look at Paul's prayer in uh, two prayers in the book of Ephesians. They're not spoken in tongues on some unknown language, as they call it, tongues. They're spoken in perfect Koine Greek. Now, Paul could have said it in Hebrew if he wanted to, and probably a couple other languages. But he didn't say it in some unknown language. He wanted God to know what he was saying. The Bible says in Hebrews that we're to come boldly before the throne of God. Boldly, not in fear of what somebody's going to say or hear from us. That's foolishness. Those words from the angels to the shepherds were angelic. But if spoken words did not come from a heart of agape love or unconditional love, as was the situation in Corinth, Paul said, my words are no more than a sounding brass, which is a noisy gong, or a tingling cymbal. Verse 1 of chapter 13. You see, some of the Corinthians would have understood this illustration for the sounding brass and the tinkling cymbal who had some understanding from their contact with the Jewish uh, uh, families that were there because in Second Samuel 6, 5 and Psalm 150 and verse 5, these instruments are mentioned as a part of worship. Part of worship. They weren't the whole worship, but they were a part of worship. So I want to give us a few examples of agape love, and I'll give you a copy of this if you want it. But unconditional love, I've got six or seven things here. Of course, John 3.16, it was the motive behind God sending Jesus Christ to die for our sins. Unconditional love, or agape, was God's, the Father's motivation for sending Christ to the earth to be the ransom for a sin-cursed mankind. That's the motivation. God's motivation, unconditional love. God so loved the world unconditionally. Didn't say he liked the world. He loved the world. No words. Philos used there. It's agape. God so loved the world. He didn't like so much what he saw. He couldn't because it's, everything was against his divine integrity which is the culmination of his righteousness and his justice. When I say divine integrity, I'm looking at his righteousness and his injustice. His righteousness is his standard, and his justice sees that his standard is kept. We all, the, one of the old sayings our former pastor used to have is that you do, if you do not adjust to the justice of God, the justice of God will adjust to you as his child. But it is. He, he, he can't not be other than who he is. And he makes no apologies for who he is. Secondly, God is said to be the source of unconditional love. So God so loved the world. That was his motivation. Number two, 1 John 4, 7 through 10. God is the source of love. 1 John 4, verse 7. 1 John 4 and verse 7. God is the source of unconditional love. Not mankind. People are not the source of this kind of love. God is. And I had to, hate to think of it, but, you know, it's a good thing that people do live isolated. Unfortunately, that's the way it is for hell. Live in eternal isolation after their passing. And probably also, as it is right now, in, in the torment side, which is only the only side there is in Hades. And people don't have an old sin nature when they die. Whether they believed in Christ or not, they don't have an old sin nature that's operative anymore. It dies with the body. But there's no one to share that there's no love there anymore. Beloved, verse 7 of 1 John, let us love one another. It didn't say like, but love. Compassionate, considerate, forbearing, patient. That's hard work. Liking is not hard work. Loving is. Let us love one another. Present active indicative. Let us keep on loving one another. For love, that agape love is, here's the, the word of, it's the objective genitive of, of description. Love is of God. 
and everyone that continues as a practice of life shows that type of love. They are they show that they are born of God and that they know God. These the Jews couldn't do this. The the unsaved Jews couldn't. They were the Pharisees couldn't. They just were cold hearted religionists for the most part. He that loveth not on a consistent basis does not know God. For God is love. Now a lot of people like to say God is love but and don't want to put down that God is also a consuming fire. God is love. God is also mercy. God is justice. God is righteousness. God is all, all powerful. And this was manifest the love of God toward us that God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. That's spiritually live through him. Zao rather than bios word there for live. That we might live through him. Herein is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us. He started it all. And he sent his son to prove it, to be the propitiation, the hilosomos, or the satisfaction to himself on behalf of our sins. So God is a source of unconditional love, not people. Thirdly, virtue or agape love is caring about others without the expectation of return. God would have sent his son if no one would have believed because it would have satisfied his justice through Christ showing mankind that there is the way that God provided that way. God is a merciful, loving God, and he couldn't help but show that mercy and love, and it was shown through Christ. Virtue love is first caring about us without the expectation of return. That's how relationships are sustained. That you love without the expectation of return. In other words, you, you, I got you a gift and you didn't get me one. Fooey on you from now on. You know, that type of thing. That's not virtue love. That's just petty. Fourthly, virtue love is about sacrificing for the good of others. You sacrifice for the good of others. That's a demonstration in other words. We will look at some examples, of course, in this 13th chapter of 1 Corinthians. But John 10, 15, As the Father knoweth me, even so know I the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep, sacrificing for the good of others. John 15, 13. Just as a verse to put on this fourth example, John 15, 13. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. That's Jesus Christ, because the next verse he says, you're my friends if you do whatever I tell you. <laughs> a lot of people didn't like, never liked that about Jesus Christ. You're my friends if you do whatever I command you. <laughs> he was kind of putting them in their place right then, wasn't he? A lot of people don't like that, but he's Lord. He's God. He's got the right to do that. I would rather be in his good keeping than trying to fake myself into thinking I was all that in a bag of chips and I wasn't. If I was, I was one of those bags that had nothing but air in it and a little bit of dust. Now you get that big bag of chips and you pop it open and you think, where did all that substance go to? There wasn't any. A lot of puff and not much fluff. But virtue love was about sacrificing for the good of others. And I'll have to add this. And greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. And, of course, this is Jesus Christ telling he's going to lay down his life for them. This is a great unconditional form of love. But he doesn't say that if we die on behalf of someone else that we get into heaven that way, because that's still not salvation. Military, I know, police forces, military, you use this a lot at, at military funerals. I've been to quite a few military funerals, and this is used a lot. And it may be that that person was saved. And it may be, and they're in heaven, they're with the Lord. But all I say is you better be right with the Lord if you expect to go to heaven. Because if you're not, you know, it might be less pain for you uh, in in the lake of fire one of these days or Hades or until then. But you can't work your own way in. I mean, it's just a lot of people like to think that they can. But that's why we have to be, you know, firefighters and Police officers do a lot of stuff a lot of times to try to look up for someone. And it seems like it's cold, but it's even colder when I'm not telling you the truth. 
You can't earn your salvation even by saving somebody else's life. This is the demonstration, God demonstrating to others his love for them, that he will lay down his life for them. And they, in turn, laid down their life for Jesus, too. When In the end, they were all martyred, except for John, and they tried to martyr him. The fifth thing here is in Ephesians 4.32, virtue of love is about forgiving those who offend you. We better have that mindset. Ephesians 4.32 says, And be ye kind to one another. That means tolerate one another. Tender-hearted. Forgiving one another. Even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Now that's a tall order sometimes. I admit, that's a tall order sometimes. If you've been in this world very long, uh, some people offend you because they like offending you. Like to get under your skin. Like to poke you and rib you. Virtue love is about forgiving those who offend you. Great peace have they who love thy law, and nothing shall offend or cause to stumble. So we have to look at that from a perspective of our character. Some examples of love. Another one is virtue love or agape motivates believers to give up a life of safety and relative ease to go to faraway lands sometimes to do service for the Lord. Second Corinthians 5 and verse 14. Second Corinthians 5 and verse 14, Paul says, For the love of Christ motivates or constrains us, motivated them to do what they did, because we thus judge that if one died for all, that is, Christ died for all, then we're all dead. And that he died for all, that they who live should not henceforth live unto themselves. This is a demonstration of agape love in our life, is that we're willing to do what God has called us to do in his service, whether it's at a local level or whatever. That they who live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him who died for them and rose again. Wherefore, henceforth know we no man after the flesh, yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more, that is, just in the flesh. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature, new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. He talks about the ministry of reconciliation there in the next few verses. And then he finally says, For he hath made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So virtue love motivates believers, men and women, boys and girls in Christ, to give up, if necessary or called upon, a life of ease to serve at whatever capacity that God may call you to serve. And typically when God calls you into a time of service, it is a time where you have to say, I cannot count the cost. Because the payback and grace and peace and the presence of the Lord that comes with that is something that you cannot put in a bank account. You cannot put a number on. You cannot put a value on it. Number seven, virtue love is just an example. Now, these are just an example. It's like a neighbor taking time out of their day to check on someone in need. I'll give you some practical application. Checking on a neighbor, checking on someone who might need a phone call or maybe an encouragement. Just checking on someone who might have a need. You can't do everything, but you can always do something. Just a voice is always something that's comfortable, comforting to people. I, I was recently called to, to go visit someone who was just lonely for fellowship. And I did. And I only got to spend a little bit of time with them before they had to go to the doctor's office. Well, they're with the Lord now. I saw them when they walked out of their house, for the, was wheeled out of their house for the last time. That's the way it goes. And I get a call yesterday and said they passed away. So that's the way it is. I'm not giving myself a pat on the back. I was... Grateful to have that little bit of time. But you never know when it's somebody else's time. And they're hungry for some fellowship. Especially when people get older and they're homebound. They're hungry for fellowship a lot of times. And sometimes 
The family can only give so much fellowship. Sometimes another face is kind of nice, nice to see. Another mug, as I say at times. Just for a little while. Might be 15 or 20 minutes. You don't have to take your tent and pitch it out in the yard. You used to hope they don't anyway. The sick of dogs after you probably around here. But taking the time out for someone to check on them. That, that's something you didn't have to do. You're not looking for a reward or anything, but you do things. Number eight, virtue love is given a financial means to help someone in need and necessarily at times. Or to see a work for God come to pass. That's a sign of virtue love. It's not just worship. It's also a sign of agape love towards God that's demonstrated as a help to someone else or some other means. Number nine, virtue love is praising a fellow believer for a job well done, even if it wasn't perfect. I've had people thank me for a job that I've done, and I go back and I think, they must have missed that part. <laughs> they must have overlooked something. I know they had to look overlook that. And so I feel like that I should do the same thing, you know. I'm not being a hypocrite because you, you accentuate the positive. You know, that's not uh, uh, a lie or a hypocrisy. You look at the things that are good that other people are doing. And um, you might not have particularly done it that way, this way, but agape love, uh, you praise a fellow believer for a job well done, even if it wasn't perfect. And you can demonstrate that to the unsaved as well as a demonstration, obviously. And number 10, uh Virtue love is demonstrated when we're obedient to the Lord when tempted to do wrong. When we are obedient. That I call closet time. Alone time. Virtue love is being obedient to the Lord when tempted to do wrong. Oh yeah. There's a verse in Scripture of 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 8. I found that it's interesting verse, 1 Peter 1, 8. You know the verse, whom having not seen ye love, and whom though ye seen him not, that is in the flesh, Peter's teaching these believers, though ye see him not yet believing, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. Now, a lot of people that Peter tried to pastor and to help uh, had never seen the Lord, much less the resurrected Lord, but he had. And so, whom having not seen you love, you still love him. And the word there for love is agape love. God wants us to have agape love toward him. Yes, he's perfect. He's not going to make a mistake. But how, since when did that stop us from scratching our head and doubting and disobeying God? No, it doesn't. Whom having not seen... Ye love. And I want to note this, that it's in the imperative mood, which is the mood of command. Oh, wow. Jesus said, if you love me, you'll do what I say. <laughs> if you're my friend, you'll do what I say. Whom having not seen, you love. You show unconditional love, which means you'll trust God like Job, even when you don't understand what's going on. That's growth. And I want to say this, that you don't have to be a believer that's been saved a long time to start showing this because these are qualities that the babe, as well as the adolescent, or of course the mature believer, can show. And as you're a babe, you start showing it more. If you'll grow and stay in the Word, you'll show it more as an adolescent. You'll be te tested, of course, but you'll show it more. And then as you become mature in the faith, you'll have, you'll have to watch your pride more than anything else. But you can do that, and that's a demonstration of your unconditional love for the Lord. I'm going to trust you even though I don't know exactly how this is going to turn out. That's unconditional love. You want to see how unconditional love looks. There's also that, again, that unconditional love toward God. I always thought that was strange. You know, of course God's perfect. How come I would have to be commanded to love him? Because God is constantly knowing. God always knows the instincts of a human being, and that is me first. That is, don't trust, but verify. Well, here's where we get our verification in the Bible. All right. Uh, let's see. 
Number 11, virtue love is not spreading gossip when a brother or sister in the Lord messes up. <laughs> yeah. What? Romans, because uh, if you wait long enough, that's going to happen. Uh, Romans 13 and verse 10, love worketh no ill to its neighbor, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. That is the law of the love complex. Love worketh no ill to its neighbor. In other words, every man stands or falls before his own master, as Paul said. Not spreading gossip when a brother or sister in the Lord messes up. And uh, let's see here. I'm going to look at this one too. First Peter, jot that down if you want to. First Peter 4 and verse 8, he says, And above all things have fervent love, virtue love, among yourselves, for love shall cover the multitude of sins. Unconditional love covers the multitude of others' imperfections. First Peter 4, 8. All right. That's, it's a lot. As I heard a preacher say years ago when he was preaching on hell, just every Sunday he was just burning the pulpit up, the thing was on fire, and the one of the deacons came to him and said, you need to back off a little bit. You're scaring people. You're running them off. So the next few weeks, he starts coming and preaching on love, unconditional love. And he told him to go back to preaching on hell. You're definitely going to lose them on that one. <laughs> because that's hard to do. You know, unconditional love is a hard task. But virtue love for another believer, as the Bible describes it, in 1 John 3, 1, it's foreign to this world. It is a foreign kind of love. First uh, John three one calls it a foreign kind of love. Potepas there, and it means not of this world. So another dimension. This type of love is another. Another. See, you're not only asked to show unconditional love for the seen world. God is calling on and commanding, as per First Peter uh, one and verse eight, He's commanding us to love even that which we cannot see unconditionally take his orders unconditionally follow his his lead unconditionally that's not easy to do and followed in the face of persecution in other words i'm going to face my death as peter did crucified i think upside down some say and is this going to be worth it is this paradise this place called bliss and heaven and uh, promise of Joy and satisfaction and and no more pain, no more sorrow, create fellowship for all eternity. Is this something that I'm actually going to get by believing in Jesus? Is he going to keep his word? Unconditional love on your part, trust that God is not a liar, that God's promises are true, that they are real. And the word of God, first John chapter two and verse five is what builds that kind of love in the believer's heart and in their mind. That's why the exposition of the scriptures is imperative to the success of the individual, much less the collected group of believers. And you can throw the band out in the ditch, as far as I'm concerned. Dump that stuff. Because that is not developing unconditional love for God. That's just trying to hype up feelings. And feelings wane, but unconditional love comes through in the, in the tempest of the, of the storm. Next point is that love is the more excellent way, as Paul said, to serve the Lord, even greater than exercising spiritual gifts. So we're back to 1 Corinthians here. 1 Corinthians 13. It's in here somewhere. <laughs> here it is. Love is the more excellent way. As of 1 Corinthians 12, 31, it's the more excellent way. It's even greater than exercising spiritual gifts. That's what Paul is saying here. Adam Clark, theologian of old, quotes one man's interpretation of this passage of 1 Corinthians 13 and 1 of the clanging bass and the brass and the tingling cymbal. He says, quote, people of little religion. Now, I explained this. It's the term... Then, in that day when he wrote, to mean those with little spiritual perception, that's what he meant, people of little religion are always noisy. People who don't have much spiritual perception are always noisy, he said. He who has not the love of God and man filling his heart 
is like an empty wagon coming violently down a hill. It makes a great noise because there's nothing in it. End quote. <laughs> you put a little weight in there, I'm going to tell you, the ride's a whole lot better. You get a vehicle, a truck, and something and get a load in it, it rides a lot, stays down on the road. It does You don't feel a lot of those bumps. But you take one that's empty and rattling. It's like my little wagon that I pull behind my truck sometimes when I'm hauling something. Clang, 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 clang. But I put a mower or a four-wheeler on that thing. It's just pretty quiet then. And that's the way Adam Clark was quoting this one man's interpretation of this passage in 1 Corinthians 13.1 that the loudest noises ones making the biggest fuss usually are empty inside. There's nothing reflective of the glory of Christ in the believer who lacks unconditional love. So verse 2 of 1 Corinthians 13, Paul continues, he says, And though I had the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries, you know, he talked about the dispensation mysteries, remember, now it's been revealed. I understand all mysteries and all knowledge. And though I have all faith, these were gifts, you see, the gift of knowledge and the gift of faith. In that case, those were gifts. So that I could remove mountains and have not agape love, I am nothing. Paul continues here, and he says, And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries, that is the deep things of God, like the Trinity, the deity of Christ, dispensational era differences, and all knowledge, that word there is notion, academic knowledge of things of God. Theological, academic understanding of God's truth. This was not spiritual understanding he's talking of, but having knowledge that Christ had taught him for three years on the backside of the Arabian Desert. As per Galatians 1, I have this knowledge, this revelation, and though I have all faith, so much so that I could remove mountains. That is that, and this is hyperbole, obviously, like poking out the eyes or cutting off your hands. Jesus says, better to do that than die. Move mountains. You're not going to move the mountains. That's hyperbole showing that God can do the most impossible things with the most improbable of people. That I could remove mountains. That is, do unbelievable things for God. He didn't say that you could remove the mountain just by saying it. You'd have to take one shovel full out at a time. My daddy taught me when I was younger, when I was working, not to work like I was fighting a fire. He said, you're not going to last. He says, I work steady, stay at it, and act as if you don't care whether you get done or not, but don't stop. He sent us out in the field to cut out thistles when he was gone to work during the day, and when he'd come back, he would go check the field for dead thistles, for chopped up thistles. He'd give me and my brother a mattock and a hoe, and he'd say, I want you all to clear this area right here. And he was doing carpenter work to help support the family, and we would go out and we would either cut cedars or thistles, and he would go out in the fields and he would inspect to see that we had done what he had told us to do. He always inspected what he expected. So I couldn't get them all done. You see them out there. They'll tear up a pasture field. They'll take over a pasture field, especially when you got cows. I mean, they're pooing everywhere. That's how that stuff gets spread. I'm just putting it out there free of charge for people who don't know this kind of stuff. Those of you who may be offended, don't move near a farm country. Yeah, I always hate when somebody from a and a strong and a and nothing wrong with the city. I've lived in the city too, but somebody lives has all lived in the city all life and move out in the country and they're upset with the local council because there's smells in their area. You like steak, don't you? <laughs> Hamburger. All right, hot dog. Well, I don't know about that. But he says, though I have all faith, so much so that I could remove mountains. That is, can do unbelievable things for God because he gives you perseverance. His perseverance he puts in you. And yet, if I have not agape love, you imagine sometimes how it is that you can keep going when you seemingly over certain circumstances would have just thrown your hands in or punched somebody or gone to jail, even in the ministry. But God gives you the ability to do unbelievable things for him that in your old flesh, you would never have stuck with. You'd have, you'd have said, kiss my foot and walked out 20 years ago or 10 years ago. And people have that in a relationship, provided it's not become violent or abusive, where you just put up with things. Now, some things you cannot put up with. 
But in the things of God, if I have all kinds of faith, so much so that I can re- I can just get into a work and just keep doing unbelievable things of God, and yet if I have not unconditional agape love, I am nothing, Paul said. Many men speak on God's behalf, and what they say may be true. A lot of women do too, as far as that goes, whether they're uh, whatever they're doing. But many speak on God's behalf, and what they say may be true. True, but in what frame of mind do they speak their truth or that truth? Do they speak it in love? Men may say they have the love of God in them, but it's more of how they act than what they say that gets across the love of God to others. How do we act? Not just how we talk. Jesus saw that in the Pharisees. He saw that they were cold, hard religionists for the most part. I'm not saying that they all were. Many of them were, and they were the ones in power. Paul experienced this fact when he was in prison in Rome, where he noted that some spoke the gospel while living a life of envy and strife in Philippians 1, 15 through 16. He said, some of you preach the gospel out of contention, not sincerely supposing to add infliction, affliction to my imprisonment and my suffering. Paul says, well, at least you're still getting the gospel out there. You see, God can serve and use people even in spite of themselves. Even if the people don't love him, God can still get some glory out of it. It's best that we learn to love as God loves, though. Some have always found a way to speak the truth of God's word, even preach the salvation message for filthy lucre. Ill-gotten gain, which is an ostentatious high-roller lifestyle is what I call it. Now, 13 and verse 3, and it says, And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, and have not love, it profits me nothing. You mean loss of reward? And maybe possibly even being burnt at the stake as a martyr, and still loss of reward? He's talking about not so much how you go out, but how you live every day. I've heard people say, I'll give my life for Jesus. I just wouldn't help you if if it killed me. Well, that's a, that's messed up, man. Though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, that's you know an expression, could be just nothing more than human good. And though I give my body to be burned, in other words, I'm willing to be made a public martyr for Christ. And yet, if I have not agape, unconditional love that is in my heart during my interaction with others then those other things that I would do that were great, grandiose things, those things profit me nothing. Because I didn't show Jesus while I was living. I stood beside of him, but I didn't know him like I should have. Paul understood that it means more to God for us to be someone for God above doing something for God. Yes, doing is important. We said that in this lesson, but being is always more important. Some believers find it easier to be courageous for Christ than to live unselfishly toward mankind. It's easier to be courageous for Christ than to live unselfishly. I'm courageous as long as I'm getting something out of it, in other words. (laughs) We are living sacrifices, Romans 12, 1 tells us. That means we are giving of our self-sacrifices. But know you not that you've been bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body, which Christ, He owns. We're not our own anymore. We've been purchased through the blood of Christ. So last paragraph, a living sacrifice is a giving sacrifice, and that means of yourself. Not much as necessary stuff as it is self. The greatest gift we can give each other is unconditional love. If you don't have anything, you can still give unconditional love. And I gave a few expressions of that this evening. If our expression of love to others is based on others saying and doing everything we liked, or always doing things nice that we liked, and never doing anything that we didn't like, well, we'd eventually none of us would ever get along. 
I'm supposed to love you based on the character that Christ is building in me and vice versa. The greatest testament we will have at the judgment seat of Christ is that we love as God loves. I think I read that a while ago. We love as God loves. He says, let all bitter, Ephesians 4, 31, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking but be put away from you with all malice. Be kind one to another, tenderhearted, that is one to another, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake has forgiven you. God was tenderhearted with us. He was forgiving of us. He was kind to us. That's the greatest testament that we'll have at the judgment seat of Christ. Not all of our works, but if we loved as God loves. That's not easy. <laughs> not easy. But it's possible. So, and that's what we're to strive for. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for laying out a mandate that we are to be conformed to the image of Christ and in his character and in his demonstration of your love to the world through his actions and his words and his prayers and his thoughts. So, Father, we ask you to help us to see these things. Help us to understand uh, in our imperfection that people are putting up with us, that in our imperfections uh, there is still work to be done. And we ask, Father, that we would be wise and humble enough uh, to let you, through your spirit and your word, do that work in us. Thank you for all you do for us. We pray that you would bless each one here in their home and in their work and in their associations with others, family, non-family, neighbors, people that they come in contact with, that we will continue to be the voice of, uh, of spiritual reason and the voice of truth uh, wherever we take uh, this testimony that we have in these earthen vessels. In Jesus Christ's name we pray, and we give thanks. Amen.